prehistory until very recently had a highly developed understanding of native tree species and woodland management. This provided them with a steady and renewable supply of timber for buildings, fuel, tools and weapons. Unfortunately, pre-medieval examples of timber building are rare. Archaeological evidence suggests that they largely consisted of structures with posts set into the ground. Although this provided structural stability, it produced buildings of limited longevity. This modern interpretation of a Celtic village shows typical construction. A significant change took place a thousand years ago with the development of the framed wall. This prefabricated building system achieved greater durability by keeping timbers clear of the damp ground. One frame type, the cruck, comprises pairs of heavy inclined beams joined together at the top and by an intermediate collar. These A-frames create the structure of both the roof and the walls. Crucks collect the roof loads from purlins spanning between the frames. But without post holes for stability, the frames could deform. Carpenters used a system of triangulated roof bracing to prevent deformation. A separate frame of posts and beams form the side walls. Cruck construction has provided some of the most enduring and beautiful examples of the medieval carpenter's craft. This tithe barn at Bradford-on-Avon, Wiltshire, dating from 1350, uses a structure known as a base cruck. Here, the cruck frames sit on a wall and provide both a wide span and a stunning architectural form. This building, designed and constructed to impress, bears witness to the longevity of the cruck technique. Alternatives to cruck frames made more economic use of available timber. Sometimes known as box or post and truss framing, this used a series of jointed vertical posts supporting a separate roof structure. This development allowed for multi-storey construction. Unlike crux, these frames could distort across their face. Bracing within each cross frame kept them rigid. In box frames, the separate roof and wall structures were both susceptible to deformation. The roof bracing was similar to that used in crux. But a braced roof would not prevent deformation of the box frame so additional bracing timbers were used to triangulate the walls. Recognition of the beauty, complexity and diversity of Britain's timber buildings has led to an increased interest in their conservation. There's been a parallel interest in rediscovering and reviving traditional techniques. At Lee Woods, trees were felled to return the woodland to coppice management. The timber was used to build a cruck frame in the heart of the woods. Oh, yeah. The project coordinator is Claire Waters. Well, I'm standing in front of a coppice stool, which is quite a large overgrown coppice. What you can see here is a common rootstock and then two stems coming up. This is quite characteristic of this particular woodland. Here you can see an old stump where you've got the new spring coming out and that is the multiple of branches which could be selected out to create two main stems like we saw earlier. These small branches would be characteristically used for um, smaller material, tool handles, hurdles and thatching spars. I'm standing now in the middle of a mature coppice spring. What you can see here is from the common root stock you've got the tree rising in a curve now, in, for our cruck frame building, that is absolutely ideal. Having a natural curve where we keep the grain and the strength of the timber and can use that to carry our rafter timbers. 
Here we can see an ideal curve on a small girth tree. This would make a single cruck blade. However, commonly, you would use a slightly larger girth tree and part it down the middle. We have one over here. This pair was made from a single tree, so we've got the beautiful curve mirrored on the other side. And what I've got here is the butt end of the chestnut blade, what was left when the saw finished the cut. I want to show you exactly how that timber was milled out of the circle of the tree. So we've got the centre here, the middle of the tree, and the bandsaw mill just took through in half, right the way through the curve. And then after that, it was then hand-hewn. This was scored out with an axe and this piece here. And there we've got two roughly square timbers, which we can still keep the curve in. Traditional tools and techniques were used. Here, a broad axe is used to score a line along a crook blade. A side axe is used to dress the rough edge. What I want to show you here is some of the different ways that we process this timber. I talked earlier about halving a bulk. Here we've got a whole tree, a single cherry stem, where just the corners have been taken off to form a square timber. You can see the circular grain there. That's the whole tree with the centre here. Here I've got a tree that's been halved. The centre of the tree is down in the bottom, and you can see the rings of the tree going out from that. So this has been halved. Up here, I've got one that's been quartered. In the near corner here is the centre of the tree, and then radiating out here, we've got the rings going this way. So this one has been quartered. This are, these are the fall-offs of the saw. Um, they'll be used by greenwood furniture makers for small furniture projects, and also the remnants, the small stuff, for charcoal making. As with all historic structural carpentry, unseasoned or green timber was used. It's easier to cut and joint. The ancient art of setting out timber frames uses geometry to overcome the inevitable discrepancies within the timber. Here we've got the reference face, heart side up. We start from the joinery, we set the blue line an inch and a half from the face, down and start the line. This line will go all the way up to the apex of the building, giving us a straight reference point. Here you can see the blue line coming on down, and we're now about three inches from the reference face. This blue line is straight, this timber is curved by about an inch and a half. We go on up to the apex, we're back again at inch and a half. So we have now a straight blue line from which we can set our joinery. Here you can see um, the timber stacked in the framing field. What we've got here is almost a template of the gable end of the building. And because all our timbers are individual curves, none of them are particularly straight or square, we use a system of marking out which uses a plumb bob and a level. So here we've got the blue line coming on through here, a nice straight line, and then we want to level the beam in its length. And so we put that level on the beam and we make it make the beam level. These lines here, you'll find them in medieval buildings, they are an indication of a level mark. They were made by placing the level on the beam, on a, on a flattened surface of the beam, and scratching either side, and then through the diagonals. This means that whenever I come back to reposition this timber, I can place my level over the level marks, 
and re-wedge the building up to level. Okay, we now have it level in two directions. This across the face here and also across its length. Here we can see the stack of timber set over the gable template. That's a full-size drawing from which we're going to transfer up with the plumb bob to our level beam, the joinery. The head carpenter, Henry Russell, explains the joinery. Right, this is, um, this is a mortise and this is the locating tenon that will go in it. Mortise and tenons are the fundamental joint in timber frame buildings. They hold the whole frame together. Um, we, we've shouldered back the tenon in this case a little bit just to get rid of a, a small amount of sapwood, which is, uh, uh, will rot in, the, in maybe 20, 30 years' time and uh, is not so good to have inside the joint. Um, we've also cut the mortise about a quarter of an inch deeper than the tenon and this allows for shrinkage on the plate here. Basically, the idea is very simple. The tenon slots in to the mortise like this and the shoulders butt up to each other as so and then we, we then once fitted together we'll mark the position of this peg hole uh, on the tenon and uh, we then take the stud out and re-drill the hole offset. So we offset this, this uh, mark by about an eighth of an inch towards the shoulder and that will help pull this tenon, the shoulders of this tenon in to, uh, into the joint. This is a, a halving joint which um, we, we make when two timbers intersect in the same plane in a wall. Um, this being a brace which, which stops the building from racking and this a stud uh, or a post uh, vertical, in, vertical in the wall. Basically the timbers are cut in half and sit like that, fit into each other and we'll probably secure the joint with two pegs which we'll, we'll put through it once the building's up rather than at the, um, at the framing stage. <laughs> well, this, this is a cog joint and the purpose of the cog joint is to locate the purlin which runs along the length of the building and uh, basically hold the trusses apart. The, if this was an imaginary purlin, it would sit in that joint like that and on its underside here there'd be cut a, a slot which would fit onto the cog, like so. Once the purlin's in, there'll also be bracing which runs from the purlin to the truss, in this case the cruck blade, and that'll stop the, the, the trusses wobbling and racking in the wind. We should be singing a song. Traditional hand tools were used where possible, although the initial conversion from log to timber was largely completed with power tools. These two joints are called um, scarf joints and they're used for extending timbers um, end to end or um, lengthening a, a timber. In this case we've got one we're using on the purlin and uh, the purlin's in the roof and it's called a splayed scarf. It's very simple and we've kept it simple because basically the only load that goes on this timber will be directly down and it's supported underneath here. This uh, scarf here is tabled and has bridal tenons and we're using it on the top plate or wall plate um, and the reason it's slightly more complex is that the rafters land on this timber like this and they thrust outwards so there's not only a load downwards but also outwards and the bridles stop that movement. As in the past, specialist knowledge of the techniques was passed on to local craftspeople, in this case volunteers with an interest in traditional framing. 
The project required a high level of team working, coordination and cooperation. Whilst the carpenters are setting out and jointing the frame, Claire is shaping the pegs which hold it all together. Over here, you can see a quarter of a log, which is much larger. This darker area here shows the sapwood. This has got more sugar in it, and we don't use this in the building. It's more prone to decay. So first of all, what we do is we split off the sap so this here, you can see, we've taken off the sap here. And then we take off now slabs, peg-sized slabs. And they will then make up into billets, which then get shaved down to squares. And then if we need a round or rounded peg, we just take the sides off of that. These are slightly tapered to allow for drawing the tenon into the shoulder. Isn't that great? So now you can see now a little bit of sap left, which is the whiter stuff, and then all these will make good pegs. That's it. Half again, and then these will make us our one inch blanks, yeah? How is it then? No, that's spot on there. In common with medieval framed buildings, the Lee Woods barn was built on a dry stone wall constructed from locally quarried stone. The wall was built directly on the ground after first removing the topsoil. Dry stone walls allow for the slow settlement of the underlying strata and the movement of the frame as it slowly seasons. While the main structure was being set out and framed, the laths and spars were prepared. These provide the infill for the frame and were hand-hewn from timber felled on the site. Split or riven timber would have made up a large proportion of the timber used in medieval times. Okay, well, we've got this, we've got this A-frame rigged up, that's the A-frame, and the job of that is to hold up the, the chain block, which is what does the lifting, okay? Attached to the top of the A-frame, we've got a wire cable going both ways, and attached to the cable at each end are a couple of winches, and those winches enable us to lean the A-frame that way or that way, depending on which frame we're lifting. Uh, for this frame, for a start, we're going we're gonna to drag it over this way, line up all the tenons along the wall plate there, and then we're going to start to lift it with the chain block. Okay, you pull on one of those chains and the main chain lifts. And we'll get it a certain way up and then we're going to pull the A-frame back to a more upright position and then keep lifting until the, until the, uh, the cross frame comes up and is in the upright position and the tenons will go in and that'll be it, it'll be, it'll be up. Remember to push it up really bad. Okay, okay, come back. Yeah, you can. 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 Yeah
Out because there's the weight of it if it goes in. Yeah. 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 Steady, comrade. A little bit more. Right, mate. Oh, look at that. Stop. Oh, my goodness. So as you can see the frame's up and the music's begun, there's more work to be done yet tomorrow, but we've had a wonderful day, the sun's shone, the joints have actually come up nice and tight, we've had a few problems but we've overcome them. I'm really excited, doesn't it look beautiful? And uh, tomorrow we've got to do purlins, wind braces, ridge beam and rafters. And that's it. My first reaction to a scene like this would be one of sadness. If I didn't know for sure that what we've got here is a potential for new coppice growth and a complete new seed bank coming in on, in on the ground already. But if we look closer, we can actually see that though this site was only felled in January, already this coppice stool is re-springing. This is a lime stump and you can already see how the new shoots are coming through new leaf, from the twigs, new buds, and all of this is full of life, it's not dead at all.
If you look closer here on the ground, you see that the oak seedlings are already starting to come up. And here, the ash saplings have had more room and light to grow and are growing on fast. Traditional forest management provides a steady supply of timber, increased public amenity, wildlife habitat and jobs. Surviving timber frame buildings show a wide chronological and regional variation. Crook frames are mostly found in the west where woodlands produce large mature trees ideal for crooks. The intensively managed woodlands in the east produce straighter, less mature timber which suited box framing. Jetties, the projection of the upper floor seen here at Church Street, Tewkesbury, probably developed within the burgeoning towns. Although we can't be sure about the reasons for jetties, they certainly provided extra space, protection to the lower storey and proclaimed the status of the owner. Status symbols and visible displays of wealth are not uncommon. As wealth grew and a greater division of labour saw a specialisation of crafts, increasingly ornate and design-conscious framing appeared. This building, dating from 1450, is a good example. It has a self-finished frame with lime-washed panels. Others were colourfully painted. Painting the frame black was a Victorian fashion. Developments in timber framing were more related to aesthetics rather than structural necessity. Close studding, which originated in the southeast, is a good example. This building in the west of England was built in 1600. Walls out of the public's gaze were frequently treated in a more rudimentary fashion. By the time this market hall was completed in 1660, timber building was coming to an end. The growing brick industry and the risks of fire in towns both played a part in its eventual decline. The revival of timber framing will be explored in another film. <laughs>